It's a really difficult decision for a filmmaker to make what is the right length to tell the story. There were a lot of things he really liked, but he wasn't sure what he needed to tell the story and what he didn't need. People say, well, why do you shoot what you know you're not going to need? I said, if I knew that, I'd have given up films 22 years ago, and I wouldn't be going through this very baffling process of making movies, which are, what do you need, what do you not need? And my gut always tells me, I need it. Interestingly enough, before I did a movie, I was never aware of score, ever. And then I really started to learn about real score on The Duelists. Um, I had a very good uh, music supervisor on that one, um, uh, Terry Rollins, who used to say, like it was magic, you know, come in my office, watch this sequence. And in those days, you got vinyl, right? So you got this. Yeah, it's a nice set, like banging off something, but he's actually turning on the machine and then lowering the needle and then mixes it in physically. And I noticed that it was magic. So now I'm very conscious about music, even to the extent of, of where am I too much music? Where should I back off? Where should I have no music? Where do I just want silence? Okay, here we go. Yep. Bar 48, please. 5M37. Ready, 48, one, two, three, and. Harry is a very talented young man who I think came out of the tradition of chorister, a serious chorister choir school. But I think very young, Harry started when he was like, before he was 10, I think, was at a boarding school, which already was entirely devoted to music and singing. And I think by the time he was 11, he could read any music sheet and play anything from any angle in any direction. Um, and he's now found his way, several years later, into composing, um, actually coming through the camp of Hans Zimmer, and uh, for a while now has been on his own. And his classical bass in terms of voices and chorale and um, the fact that Harry also is, you know, very modern in his view and outlook helps so he's able to put classical elements together without it becoming pretentious here we are bar nine please five and 41 someone explain that we're just rehearsing eight two three and Ridley's going to use every moment he can to make the best film he can, and that's ignoring score for a moment. That's getting the best possible cut of the movie together. You know, he's still busy in his editing room. That's why it's great to have him here today, because I'm sure he won't be here tomorrow. He'll be deep, deep, deep in his editing room. You know, lots of decisions he has to make. But we're running in tandem, you know what I mean? We're basically working like dogs, that's what's happening. <laughs> Our post team came back, they didn't take a day off. They flew straight from Wazazat to Los Angeles and did not take a day off. Uh, Ridley didn't take any time off, he also came straight back. And they were in the cutting room within days of wrapping. After the completion of principal photography, we went back to LA for the director's cut period. And then we went to London because the visual effects houses were in London. Ridley and Doty were working together fr right off the top. I mean, Doty had been cutting all along, so she had already stuff to look at. But Ridley was uh, figuring out the time. What was the amount of time the movie wanted to be? How long did it want to run? The running time on a film is always a surprise. Anyone says to me on a page count, says, yeah, this is a hundred and whatever pages the, it'll come out at X or Y is usually wrong. They're usually wrong by 20 or 30 pages. And I, I'm always amused by that because every film is different. Every film is an organic, different process. And the way I work anyway is I don't just follow the order book. I don't just follow the instruction book, which is the script. There was a large stretch of the film that was less 
shaped by the script. The whole entire siege, even though there was sort of a general idea, it wasn't tightly scripted. And that was very time consuming. And I did some of it on my own, but then we did a lot of it together. And then we restructured it many times, many different ways together. I tend to put a lot of things in. So that means my cuts always go boom, like this, really spread. And I know I'm going to lose a lot of it because I know there's going to be a practical time for this movie where you don't pass into what I call the bum ache syndrome. Bum ache means that you're in a seat and the theater going, oh, <laughs> and you know, why the bloody hell doesn't he get on with it? That's called a bum ache process. And that's when you find out only when you get in the editing room. I think that there was always the imperative that we keep even though we knew this was an epic, that we keep it within a certain sort of manageable commercial length. And uh, we, did, we did have a longer cut that had a, a pretty large subplot with Sibylla and her son. And we felt that in a sort of a commercial milieu, that that was a side story when we took into account the length of the film that we wanted to achieve and the strength of the story that we were trying to tell about Balian. So what, what ended up happening was that we, although we had a cut that had that fully fleshed out with Sibylla and her son, uh, we found that when we took that story out, the focus shifted back to Balian, and the through line, his narrative through line was stronger. My experience over the years, I'm both economically very conscious and creatively very conscious. So it's a very odd process of, there's an internal battle going on at all points, where eventually I'll just make a decision and say, screw it, cut that, 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 that. And then you, and you have to do that. You gotta be prepared to do that. Otherwise you'll get it cut for you. At this stage, like for instance today, we're about four weeks away from the final dub of the movie. That's basically read music delivery. And probably four weeks beyond that is the release date. So we're getting close. But that's not to say Ridley's finished his part of the film. You know, he's still cutting the film. He's still previewing it. He's still deciding. He's still massaging. He's still making the movie. So I'm working in, and this is not unusual, I'm working in tandem with that, where I'm trying to make my score, but often playing catch up because you know, I blink and a scene that I scored yesterday is gone. It hasn't just moved, it's just gone, which is fine. And so we're, we're, we're kind of skirting each other. And you know, that, that, that's, that's the process. He, he's, he's still fine-tuning his movie. I think this is becoming common practice for most films, that, that you're working and working and changing and refining right up until the last minute. And everybody has to be able to be quick on their feet or it wouldn't, it wouldn't get done. There was a structure in a way that post-production used to work when you were working on film. There was a cutoff point after which you could make no more changes. But that cutoff point is slowly evaporating till it comes down to the point that until you've made your, finished making your last print, that's the cutoff, <laughs> that's the cutoff point. Actors say to me, you know, do you ever lose patience or do you get bored? I said, never, ever, ever. Get, lose patience often, never get bored. Because every phase is a completely different new set of values and questions. And now I'm hitting the final two strides, which is score, which is huge. Harry will have to do, I would think, probably two hours, ten minutes original score. That's a lot. Then we've got to mix it. So Mike Minkler's coming over to mix it in the UK. And uh, everything's always different. That's what makes the job great. Okay, let's stop there.